We'll make it matter. We're talking about a life that matters. This is our legacy series, a life that is multiplied, a life that goes beyond your time here on this earth, a life that outlives you. Uh, I told, I said this a couple weeks ago, that my wife and I's goal is all the integrity, character, everything that God has downloaded to us, we want to pass it on to our kids, right? And then their kids' kids, the ceiling and the lid that's in our lives, we want it to be the floor for our kids, a foundation that they can build upon. So we're going to jump in to the word uh, pretty quick here this morning. I love the amplified version, uh, the way it reads in Romans 8 and Romans 11. If you're taking down notes, you can write down Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It'll be on the screen as well. I'm coming in a little hot this morning, y'all. I woke up ready to bring the word. The Bible says in Romans 8, verse 28, and we know, I love this, with great confidence that God who is deeply concerned about us, now deeply concerned is great affection. He loves you. Not mad at you, but madly in love with you, that God who is deeply concerned about us causes all things to work together as a plan for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his plan and his purpose for your life. A few chapters down, Romans 11, verse 29, same amplified, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, for he does not withdraw what he has given. Now pause, that's huge. So God's not taking away the gifts and talents he gave you, but watch this, we have free will, we can squander those gifts, We can refuse to walk in that authority. We can refuse to walk in the assignment. We can refuse to not allow God to work through the purpose and the talent and gifts he's blessed us with. But it says right here, he doesn't take them away, nor does he change his mind about those to whom he gives his grace or to whom he sends his call. So God has placed specific and unique gifts and call and assignments on each and every one of our lives. And this is super important. I want somebody to grab this. I think this is one of the most important things that we can grab this week and watch this. God did not give you anything that he intended for you to waste. I'm gonna say that again for my friends in the back. Somebody watching online. God did not give you anything that he intended for you to waste. If he gave you the ability, then he also supplied you with the capability to walk it out. He never gave you anything that he just was like, well, I gave her a little too much. I just, that can all just be wasted. No, no, if he gave you the ability, he also will unlock the capability because underutilized or untapped ability is simply potential. And potential and and, and purpose run parallel. The foundation of our ability and capability comes from God and God alone. And this is key. If you don't recognize your potential, you'll never fully walk in your purpose. That's why it's extremely important what we do with our time, our talents, and the three T's, our treasure. And some of y'all are like, what? If you're new to church, resources. Uh, some of y'all are like, treasure? This is a treasure hunt. This is amazing. Like we're doing a scavenger hunt immediately afterwards. No, it's important what we do with our time, our talent, our treasure, because it's essential for us to walk out who we are called to become. And we don't want to waste. I know for me, Y'all, I literally pray every day, God, if you're gonna move in this city, if you're gonna move and revival's gonna break out, let it start at Hope City. If you're gonna move in our lives, don't overlook us, God. I never want anything to go wasted. I want every, every ounce of my time, I want all the talents and abilities you've blessed me with, I don't want any of them to go wasted. He's entrusted us, again, with gifts and assignments, and we have to align our lives in relationship with him so that we can fulfill and walk it out. So I want to unpack and talk about faithfulness for a moment. And uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says it this way. Let us hold firmly to the confession of our hope. Another translation says our faith without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Say, my God is faithful. Come on, God doesn't change. He's consistent and he is faithful. And the Bible is full of accounts of God's faithfulness to his people. Watch this. In Exodus 14, he saved the Israelites from the Egyptians. In Genesis 21, he blessed Sarah with a baby in her old age. Some of y'all are like, that is not a word for me. (laughs) In 1 Samuel 17, he delivered David in battle, David said the battle is the Lord's and God's faithfulness was never more astounding than when he delivered us from the very grips of sin and gave us a way to join him in heaven 
through Jesus. Now, if you've watched football, how many other football fans? Come on, somebody. Uh, uh, you've probably seen the guy with the poster board and the big Sharpie marker standing behind the field goal post with this, the verse, John chapter three, verse 16. Wave at me if you know what I'm talking about. Put a little wave emoji on that. Yeah, right, because we've all seen it. We can all probably say it, and I want you to actually read it with me out loud. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God is faithful. And in his faithfulness, he bankrupt heaven and sent his best gift. He sent his very son so that we could live forever in eternity with him. So that's God's faithfulness towards us. But the Bible also is very clear about how we're supposed to be faithful to God. So what does it mean to be faithful to God? Again, God's faithfulness to his people is not the same as our faithfulness to him. When God is faithful to us, he cares for us, he leads us, and he loves us. When we're faithful to him, we trust that he will care for us, right? We follow where he leads us, and we love him in return. But being faithful also means that there's some evidence of your faith in God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5 says this, so that your faith would not be based on human wisdom, but on God's power. So a faithful Christian, again, if you're new to the faith, the word Christian literally means Christ-like. So to be a Christian is to walk in relationship with the Lord. And when you walk in relationship with the Lord, y'all, there should be some fruit. Thanks for your overwhelming enthusiasm. There should be some fruit. People should be able to tell there's something different about her. When he walks into the room, there's a different peace that follows. When he walks into the room or she walks in the room, I feel goodness and I feel mercy. I feel hope. There should be fruit that follows. Faithfulness, this is huge, isn't always fun. But in your obedience, it is always fruitful. I'm going to say that one more time. Faithfulness isn't always fun. But in your obedience, it is always fruitful fruitful. The Bible says in John chapter 15, verse five, and we know this verse. I, I preach it all the time. I'm the vine. You're the branches. So he's the vine. We're the branches. Those who live in me while I live in them will produce a lot of fruit, but you can't produce anything without me. Y'all, why are we trying to do so many things on our own? Why are we trying to, in our humanity, like, well, God, I trust you with these things, but I'm gonna try, I'll do, I got me on this. No, no. He's saying, listen, remain in me and I in you, and you will bear a, a bunch of fruit. But apart from me, you can literally produce nothing. And this is what fruit looks like when you are exuding fruit, when you're faithful to God, and in return, he's being faithful to you, and you're in right standing in relationship. This is what it looks like, Galatians 5. 22 and 23, that's what it says. But the fruit of the Spirit, y'all know this, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Leave it up for a minute. I, I want you to think about this for a minute. In my life, are there any areas that I'm not exuding? A am I exuding uh, joy? Am I exuding peace? H how's my kindness? Where's my goodness? Where, where's my self-control? And I want you to re read back through this, Galatians chapter five, verse 22 and 23 this week, and areas of your life that you feel depleted in, areas of your life you feel like aren't producing fruit, I want you to begin to ask God, God, show me in your word where I can allow you to remove some things in my life that are distracting and I can exude this type of fruit. Jackie and I have a healthy marriage of 17 years. Somebody should clap, that's amazing. It's a full-on testimony in my family, 17 years this last July. And, and the truth is, we haven't had a perfect marriage, but in our covenant, we have remained faithful, and there is fruit that follows that faithfulness. If you uh, are faithful to your word, you know, you, you've heard it, well, he, he keeps his word, he's good for his word, he's faithful to his word. The reputation is that you're an honest person. When you're faithful in character and you're faithful in integrity, there are blessings that follow because these are all attributes of the heart of God. Luke chapter 16, verse 10 says it this way. If you are faithful in the little things, God will honor you and bless you and you'll be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. So again, faithfulness isn't always fun, but in your obedience, it is always fun. Fruitful. Let me say this with all sincerity. We've all got stuff. Faithfulness does not mean you're gonna live a perfect life. 
doesn't mean you're not gonna struggle or make poor decisions, but it does mean that we need to continue to trust God and follow his leading even when life is difficult. Pastor Jeremy said this, I've said this, there's enough grace for every goof up. There's enough mercy for every mistake. How many of y'all are grateful for the grace and the mercy of God that has never ran out on you? God knows our abilities and he knows our capabilities because they come from him. He knows that we're not all given the same gifts, talents, and opportunities, and he does not, this should take all the pressure off of somebody, he does not expect the same results from all of us. Like, I know I use her as an example a lot, and our Hope City worship team is incredible, but every time Myra sings, like, I know I sing, but like, she sang. Like, she can like, she can really, really sing. And if I was constantly caught up in comparison and constantly caught up in what I don't have, I'll miss the opportunities that God is trying to unlock in me. Somebody say this out loud, I'm chosen by God. Come on, I need you to grab that. I say this all the time because I need you to understand the depth of being chosen by God. You were handpicked, you were shaped in his image. And some of you haven't been living the life that God wants you to live, fulfilled and walking out that life that looks more abundantly because you have been concerned and caught up in comparison. Call me crazy, but I love seeing other people win. Like I love to see other people thriving. I, 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 you, there was a season in my life that I'd be like, oh, really, God? You're gonna bless him like that? Really, God? She's gonna be the one that gets promoted, right? But there's, I'm in a season now where I love seeing other people win. We have to learn to celebrate others in our waiting season. We, we have to be faithful in our waiting season and rejoice and celebrate when others are winning because your time is coming. Look at the person next to you and say, the harvest is, is getting close. It's getting close. Come on, my time is coming. Because here's the truth, when you wait on God's timing, God's timing is perfect. And when you know that his way is way better, you'll want to remain faithful in the waiting. So we've been talking about faithfulness for a minute. I wanna shift gears and I wanna look at another foundation. And I said all that to say, because I'm gonna lose a few people, but I need you to grab this, because I believe that this is a word for our house this weekend. We're gonna shift gears and look at another foundation that we can build our legacy and a life that matters upon. We're gonna be talking about more in depth this weekend, the word stewardship. That's not a glamorous word. It's not super fun. I lost some of you. You're like, oh Lord, he's got super deep. I'm gonna make my, no, no, uh, stewardship. I believe God is asking us to be good stewards and specific areas of our lives. And this weekend, we're gonna focus on our time, our talent, our resources. And there are two things statistically that people don't wanna be told what to do with. Number one, they say statistically, is people don't wanna be told what to do with their money. Right, where's all that, where, like, where are you at? Wave at me real quick. Okay, cool. Like, you're like, you're not gonna tell me what to do. I'm gonna lift my hand right now. What you'll hear consistently here when Ben closes out here at West Houston, our other hosts at our other locations this weekend, uh, you'll hear this phrase uh, that we will never ask you for a specific amount. If this is your first time at Hope City, when we have a time to give later, feel no obligation to give, this weekend is actually our gift to you. Uh, but we'll never manipulate, twist your arm. This is not an infomercial. Like, if you give, we're also gonna give you some ShamWow rags <laughs> and some Ginsu knives. Like, what is that? We will never manipulate you. We are just asking that you would ask God, God, how can I be a good steward? How can I be generous? And then just simply be obedient to whatever he says. So statistically, people don't want to be told what to do with their money. And number two, they don't want to be told what to do with their parenting. That's the truth. Don't tell me how to raise my kids, right? So my wife and I have four. And um, when we first got married, we went out with this couple who had a sweet little girl. She was three or four. And we were eating at one of those places where they like, you know, they ate peanuts and shells and threw them on the floor. So this, this place is, it's a train wreck. I'm like, is anybody clean? Oh, it's part of it. Like, we don't have to hire people to clean it. We just trash the place. That's what we do. We just... And so this little girl is about to eat this hot dog and the hot dog rolls off the bun on the table. I watch it in slow motion, hit the booth and roll under the table. I'm like, Ugh. like, that's not okay. <laughs> I said, okay, so I'm like, I need to get the waiter over. And the mom goes, oh, no, no, that'll be way too much trouble. And so she's digging under the table. <laughs> she gets it, she's like, got it. And I was like, yes, you, maybe. That could have been somebody else's. <laughs> we don't know for sure. She brush, blood, like, <laughs> dips it in a cup of water, which I think was mine. <laughs> Puts it back on the bun and goes, problem solved. And I'm like, is it? Is it Elaine? Was it soft? Is that super disgusting? 
Don't tell me how to raise my kids. I remember my wife and I had all kinds of opinions when we didn't have kids, but now that we have four, my wife likes to say, you ever made people? You, you ever made people before? Because I've made my own people. And they call me their leader. It's the craziest thing. Like, I've made, <laughs> I've made my own. So they don't always tell what to do with their money. People don't want to be told how to parent. But here's the truth. Uh, when I was growing up in church, I always thought stewardship only meant money and resources. So it's a heavy word. Like I said a moment ago, some of you checked out. It's a very poised and proper word. But watch what stewardship actually means. Stewardship means using God-given abilities to manage God-given resources to accomplish God-ordained results. Y'all want to hear some God-ordained results? Uh, we've seen 45,386 people give their lives to Jesus here at Hope City in the past six years. 5,932 people have taken the next step in water baptism in the past six years. Y'all, that sounds like God-ordained results. Okay, so if uh, stewardship isn't merely about giving to church and it's not merely about money, like it's part of it, like giving resources, sowing it, yet yeah, that's part of stewardship, but it's not stewardship. Or if serving and, and, and giving of my abilities week in and week out and being on the dream team is, is that stewardship. Again, it's, it's stewardship, but it's, par, it's a part of stewardship. It's not, it doesn't encompass the word stewardship. So, so how do I become a good steward? And how do I unlock stewardship in my life? Number one, if you're taking down notes, write this down. Stewardship begins in the heart. It begins in the heart. Your heart determines your actions. And your actions determine if you're a good steward or not. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, verse 23, guard your heart above all else. Why? Because out of it determines the course of life. Everything flows from it. It's not what you give, it's not what you do, it's the heart behind why you do it for God. So if you give money and you give resources with the wrong attitude, then you're not being a good steward. If you serve week in and week out, you're like, I can't believe they make us good here at 4.30. <laughs> like, um, I mean, I'm up earlier than that praying, but if you do it with the wrong attitude, then you're not being a good steward. The heart behind stewardship is everything. And here's the truth, we don't have to do any of this. We get to do this. Like we get to gather in his name because people matter to God, so they matter to us, y'all. We show up week in and week out at Cinco Ranch, at the Woodlands, our online location here at West Houston and beyond this, silos eventually. We get to do this because God has entrusted us with it. So number one, stewardship begins in the heart. Number two, stewardship is for every season of life. It's a big deal. Whether you're in a super lean season or you have it all together, the misconception is I'll be a good steward when I have it all figured out, right? I'll be a good steward when like, my money is not so funny, right? I'll be a good steward when I grow and climb the, the, the career ladder and I'm, I'm doing better in my career. No, the reality is stewardship is for every season of life. There's a friend of ours here at Hope City. I think it was two or three years ago, we were doing the Blessed Life series, and him and his wife were sitting in the back here at West Houston, and he said, he looked at her and said, babe, our money's out of order. And he said, I think that we need to, for the next year, from today on, commit to, to tithe, uh, the first fruits of everything that comes in, we need to commit to that, and we need to be way more generous. We're, we're hoarding too much. We're holding on to too much. And her and him made a commitment in that moment out of Proverbs chapter three, verse nine and 10, honor the Lord with your wealth, and with your first fruits. And then it says, all your produce, your barns will be filled with plenty. He said, I wanna start tithing consistently off of our increase, and I wanna start giving. Watch this. He said, when we made that commitment, we felt a shift. Now, it, it was uncomfortable, and his wife was like, can we afford to do this? And he said, I really feel in my spirit we can't afford not to do it. Now, at this moment, that his, his, his company uh, had like four or five people on a waiting list. He said, Daniel, after we committed to do this, our company now has a waiting list of four to five months because when we committed to what stewardship looked like and we committed to generosity and we committed to the tithe week in and week out on all of our increase and we were responsible with what God entrusted us with, we saw God's hand in every area of our life. And then the verse that popped out was Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. Watch this. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be where your treasure is, your gifting, your time, your resources. 
If it's really about helping others, it will be obvious if it's in your heart. Again, it's all about the heart. And the question that he said to his wife was, can God trust us? Like, can he trust us with managing what he's blessed us with? So my question to you this weekend is, can he trust you? Can he trust you to be a good steward? Can he trust you to, to manage what he's been blessing you with? Because the reality is it all comes from him anyways. Y'all, the oxygen we're breathing is a miracle. It's a miracle we woke up again today. So can he trust you with what he's blessing you with? Well, you don't understand, Daniel, I've got so many needs, I've got so many, and I'm not downplaying the stuff that we have going on in our lives, but can he trust you with the little so that he can trust you with more? Reminds me of the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. The first man was given five bags of gold and he gained five more. The second man was given two bags of gold to be entrusted with and he ended up gaining two more. The third man, though, had one bag of gold and in Matthew chapter 25, verse 25, the man said that he was afraid that he was gonna lose that one bag of gold, so he went and buried it. I want us to catch this today. God, our creator, has entrusted us. God, our creator, has entrusted us, every one of us, with gifts, talents, skills, and he's entrusted us with resources and abilities, and if we allow fear to grip us like that third man, we'll stay stuck in a rut and we'll never fulfill our potential, we'll never fulfill our purpose because we're literally burying our gifts and our talents. So I want you to write this down if you're taking down notes. Don't bury your potential, release it and live by faith. You can write that down. Don't bury, I don't wanna bury my potential, but I wanna release it and live by faith. Because here's the truth, in our humanity it's way easier to hide. It's way easier to just stay on the sidelines and never jump in. It's way easier to just live in cruise control. But your purpose is not just about you. Your purpose is about others. We all have this certain window of time. And uh, this rope here represents uh, time. So you've got the red part. That's what, 80 something years maybe, statistically. Uh, long life runs in your family. I had a grandma that lived to like 103. She was wild though, like she refused to die. She's like, I am not dying. <laughs> but the reality is we're not all promised tomorrow. The Bible says in James four, verse 14, it refers to our life as a vapor, a fog that fades away. We love to say the phrase YOLO. But YOLO's not true, you don't only live once. But this in our humanity is all we can think about. The truth is this entire thing's about eternity. This entire thing is about eternity. What you do on this earth echoes and ripples throughout eternity. That's why it gives us peace. When God says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, he's not only saying here and now, but he's saying forever. That's why it gives us comfort and peace when we lose a loved one or a family member that it's not goodbye, but it's see you later. It gives us this comfort that what we do here on this earth will echo throughout eternity. The way you serve, the way you give, y'all, I believe with all sincerity, that there will be people that will walk up to us in heaven and say, thank you for the way you sowed. Because you gave to that missionary, my family was rescued. Because you built that building, my brother who was far from God was saved. Because you planted that campus and y'all built that silos property, my mom came to know the Lord. Because it's not just the little part of life that we're living. God is far more interested in the now, but he's also looking at our eternity. So my question is, are you living your life to your greatest potential? Are you fulfilling your purpose? Has God been able to unlock the assignments in your life? Because here's the truth, it's not too late. I know sometimes these big purpose sort of series makes the young folks in the 30s and 40s and 50s be like, woo, let's go. But others say, well, Daniel, I've missed it. I should have done this 25 years ago, but if God's in it, I'm telling you right now, it's not over. You woke up again today, which is proof that he's not done with your life. There's still healing in your hands. He can still anoint the creativity and the dreams that are in your heart. So my question, because people, people's lives are connected to our purpose on earth, but like we just saw, it echoes in eternity. So another loaded question this weekend is, who are you reaching? Does your life reflect and look like Jesus? Now again, God's not looking for perfect or polished, he's looking for purposed. 
which is why we're passionate about people going through growth track and jumping on the dream team. Wave at me if you're part of the dream team. Come on, somebody. The dream team is not full of perfect people. It's full of purposed people. So another loaded question for week number four is uh, how do you manage your time? How are you spending your time? Because that shifts the narrative of a life that matters. Apple introduced a screen time feature a few years ago and it tells you how much time you're spending on your phone. And a lot of y'all use the reason, well, the truth is I, I work on my phone, but you, seven hours on the gram and tickety talk is not managed. I know it's TikToks, <laughs> but it's not ma managed time well, right? Uh, I love this story of an older gentleman who would sit at this bus stop and there was a 20 year old intern who was fired up at the beginning of his career. He would sit at the same bus stop. This older gentleman was retired had lived an incredible life, had had an amazing career, and he would sit at the same bus stop reading a book. And the 20-year-old intern came over to him and said, hey, I, I ride the same bus with you every day, and I'll be honest, I've been, I've been noticing, you're never on your phone, uh, you're always reading what looks like the same book. Why do you read that same book? Is it, is it that great of a book? And he said, now, nah, to be honest, uh, I don't believe in killing time. I take my time because I want to make the most out of every moment. I want to experience the wonders of life. If you're really watching me, you'll notice I read a little bit and I look around. I'll take a deep breath and enjoy the air. Now here in Houston, it's full of pollen. <laughs> Coats the inside of your mouth. But he said, I want to take everything in. And at my age, I still want to embrace every moment because I can watch this. I can still be growing every day. I can still be learning. I can still make the most of my time. And then I can pass on my experiences to you in the next generation. It's a domino effect. I love the acronym of the word time. Things I must experience. Now, anybody who knows me knows I'm big on time. If you're 10 minutes early, you're on time. If you're on time, then you're late. And if you're 10 minutes late, then you better have a really good excuse. I just, I'm, 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 I'm very punctual. Now, my wife, there are exceptions to all you mamas in the room. My wife has four kids, but she also, when she knows she's gonna be late, will wear a T-shirt that says, sorry, I'm late, I didn't wanna come. So, <laughs> that's a real shirt. But how you manage your time is directly connected to unlocking the purpose and call of God on your life. How you manage your time with your family, how you manage your time between work and relationships, how you manage your time serving and being a part of what God's doing here at Hope City, it's all tied to purpose, and we really believe that life moves at the speed of relationships. So let me, let me back up and tell you part of my story, uh, part of the reason why I'm here. Uh, over 10 years ago, Pastor Jeremy and I, who we didn't know each other at all, we were asked to speak keynotes at the same conference. He didn't know me, I didn't know him. Now that season of my life, I was not a good steward of my time. I did not manage my time well. I didn't even, the phrase time management was not a part of my vocabulary. And so I struggled, and I've had way too many yeses. I put too many things on my plate. My wife came to me and said, you seem stressed. I said, I think I'm gonna cancel that, that conference. Uh, I know it's a little last minute, but I just don't have the time. She said, babe, you are not administrative. And, and I was like, yes, I am. She's like, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. She said, spell it. I was like, I need your help. I need your... <laughs> She said, let me help you with time management because I really feel like you're supposed to be at this conference. So I fly in, Pastor Jeremy's preaching at this conference, some other amazing leaders are preaching at this conference, I'm preaching at this conference. Pastor Jeremy and I ended up sitting up in the hotel lobby till like three in the morning, talking and laughing, and God did something. He solidified in the spirit something that we didn't realize was part of our future. God began to align covenant, and all these years later, because I allowed Jackie to help me be a good steward of my time, that moment there unlocked purpose in us now. Y'all, I'm here at Hope City. My family moved to Texas because of that moment 10 years ago, but what if I wouldn't have been a good steward of my time? So number one, stewardship begins in the heart. Number two, stewardship is for every season. Number three, stewardship requires Willingness, willingness to be stretched outside of our comfort zone. I've said this before, a comfort zone is great because it's comfortable, but nothing ever grows there. And when you step outside of the comfort zone and you begin to align your life and connect your will to God's will, he'll begin to stretch you. And y'all, it's very uncomfortable. But when you get your yes out of the way and you begin to place everything in God's hands, you will begin to see God's hand in every area of your life. 
So I, I've used this analogy before, and I'll use this pray first wristband. Uh, it reminds me to pray first, amen. Uh, but you know, a rubber band is no good to just be stuck in a drawer. A rubber band is only valuable when it's stretched. And the thing about a rubber band being stretched is the science behind it, after it's stretched, it never goes back to the original size it was before it was stretched. See, when you are positioning yourself, because again, stewardship requires willingness, when you align yourself under the mighty hand of God, there is a stretching, and it is uncomfortable, but watch this. Inside of that stretching, God, inside of that room right there, he, he begins to build more audacious faith. He begins to unlock more wisdom and clarity and joy because God will never leave you where he found you. So in that stretching of willingness, God will begin to pour more into you, more bandwidth for your call and your potential. All right, shifting the final gear, wrapping this up, I wanna look these last few moments we have through the lens of generosity for a moment. I love what Pastor Jeremy says. He says, we make a living by what we get but we make a life by what we give. Y'all, we're a generous church. Y'all are a generous church. Whether it is a disaster relief, a local outreach, whether we're helping another ministry across the nation like LA Dream Center, y'all, we have become an incredibly generous church because of your faithfulness. Give yourselves a hand, it's amazing. A lot of you serve week in and week out with our Hope City Missions team on the weekends, whether it's local or a global reach. Guys, we are doing some serious damage to the kingdom of darkness because of your generosity. One more time, give yourselves a hand and give our Hope City Missions a hand. Because we filter everything and we're a good steward with what God has entrusted us with, we're not just a local reach, but we're a global reach with global impact. I love the definition of the word generous. It's liberal in giving, and one who lives, watch this, open-handed. A generous heart and a generous life starts with a revelation from God. When you get a revelation from God, it will fuel your dedication to God. The reason why we bought the property, the silos property, at 10 and Beltway 8, over 550,000 people drive by there every day. If statistically two to three people are in a car, that's over a million people that will drive by. We truly believe the silos is gonna be a house of miracles. Come on, how many of y'all's faith can hook up with that? And we didn't just to expand and grow, we did it to make an even greater impact. And I believe Exodus chapter three, there's this moment where Moses was tending to his father-in-law Jethro's flock and there's a burning bush, y'all know the story. And the moment Moses turned aside, God spoke out of the bush. I believe there are gonna be people driving on 10 and Beltway eight every day. And the moment they turn aside, Romans chapter two, verse four, the goodness and love of God will begin to draw them in like a moth to a flame. And God will begin to draw them in. And that place is going to be a modern burning bush moment for the city of Houston and beyond. Thousands of people will be healed. Thousands will be set free and delivered. And we truly believe that when we align ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he's going to provide everything we need. And here's the reality with the Silos Project. We do not measure our own resources against what's needed. We measure God's resources against what's needed. And we truly believe that when we live an open-handed life, God is gonna supernaturally provide. Can somebody say amen? amen? And we are unapologetically, we've said this since the beginning, unapologetically believing for 100% participation. Again, if this is your first time, feel no obligation to be a part, but if God has been stirring in your heart to make a pledge or so towards the silos, I'm telling you, it is good ground and thousands of people are gonna be impacted, maybe even family members that you know. But here's the reality. I said this before, I said it earlier. We say this and we continue to say this every, almost every single week. If you're gonna give and when you give, don't do it reluctantly, but let's do it with joy. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 that God loves a cheerful giver. Come on, smile real big. Because if you give with the wrong attitude, then don't give. If you serve with the wrong attitude, then don't serve. My wife and I, 17 years ago, made a commitment that even in lean seasons and tough times, we were gonna be committed to the tithe and we were gonna continue to give. And I'm telling you, God has always showed up when we have been faithful. Now, sometimes it's in the 11th hour, but I, I came up with this little adage that said, listen, God, I trust you so much, even when I can't track you, that I'll praise you now and you can do it later because you've been better than good to me. So we're gonna just keep on giving through it. We're gonna keep on praising through it. You can go to hopecity.com slash silos if you want more information. I know that sounds a little bit like a spiel, but the truth is, I'm not gonna apologize about it. 
We believe that all of us should be a part because we can't all do everything, but we can all do something. Y'all believe that? Look at the person next to you and say, I believe it. Come on. When Jackie and I got married 17 years ago, we agreed then that we were going to be faithful with our tithe and our generosity. And we trusted God and we said, God, uh, uh, you can do more with 10% in your hands than we can do with all 100% in our hands. So, so we're going to trust you. And I remember there was a season where it was like, I don't know if we can afford this. And then we realized we can't afford not to, right? Because there was audacious faith rising in us to sow more into church plants and sow more into the kingdom. And I'm telling you, even in lean seasons, we saw the hand of God show up and move. And it might have been in the 11th hour, but God would always show up. And we just kind of a, 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 a adopted this adage that said, God, I'll praise you now and you can do it later because you've been better than good to us. And so we made this commitment and all throughout, we've seen God's hand move in our lives. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I am bringing this in for a landing. Chapter nine, verse eight, watch this. And God will generously provide all that you need. But I love this part. Then you will have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. I'm gonna have my friend Taz come out real quick. My buddy Taz, give Taz a hand. Taz, I wanna bless you. Uh, this is gonna drive the vegans crazy. Uh, I'm gonna bless you with two tangerines. This represents your checking account, your savings account, your crypto investments. <laughs> and I don't want you to let go of them. Because here's the reality. This is the way we approach a life a lot of times. Like, we're not going to have enough, right? So if I, if I let go of what I have, I'm never going to have enough. So I hate that others are going through a lot. And Daniel, I love to sow towards the silos, and I'd love to be a part. But I just, I just can't let go of this, because this is, this is all that I have. But the Bible says this. Watch this again. It says that he will generously provide all that you need and you will have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. So when you're holding on to what you have too tightly, God's saying, hey, Taz, I want to bless you with a promotion, buddy. And I want to give you more. I want to, I want to bless you with, oh, wait a minute. But because you won't let go of what's in your hands, you can't receive everything that I'm trying to open for you. And we miss out on all these blessings and all these moments. Now, Taz... I'm going to ask you to do something. This is a little uncomfortable. I need you to let go of what's in your hands. Now watch this. The, the skeptic and the naysayer says, he missed out on all these blessings and you manipulated him and to give up everything that he had. And the enemy loves this place. This is where you start questioning, uh, oh, I see what the church has done. They, they're trying to manipulate and coerce me to give. And God's saying, no, 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 I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm trying to get something to you and, and through you. And when you release what's in your hands, God will begin to release what's in his hands. And there's favor and Luke 252 favor and backdoor blessings that there's abundance and more than enough. And then you can be generous and bless others. The Bible says in Luke 638 to give to others and he will give to you a full measure, a generous helping, poured into your hands all that you can hold. More than enough. And to, Wow, it just keeps on coming. And Taz, here's the reality. You started with two. You missed out on all these blessings, but because of his grace and his mercy, he said, hey, I still have some blessings for you because I'm a God of more than enough. I'm a God that will... And check this out. There's some people here. I'm, can we give away some of these? Is that okay? I'm going to hook you up. Go ahead. You've got more than enough. I'm going to... Carla, there you go. Uh, that's, be careful. They weigh 19 pounds. All right, bless somebody else and then get out of here with all your fruit. Vitamin C. Give Taz a hand. And we will need those back. They're props for next service. <laughs> I'm not going to buy 100 bags of oranges, so amen. <laughs> to much is given, much is required. The Bible says in Acts 20, verse 35, it's more blessed to give than to receive. But I think the misconception is that all you do is give and you never have anything. But every farmer gets to keep a little seed himself. He will bless you when you are willing to live open-handed and allow him to pass through those blessings to others. The statement of Jesus out of Luke 12, 48, to much is given, much is required, has become somewhat of an adage in Western culture and found paraphrased in Uncle Ben's words of wisdom and to Peter Parker and Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Stand to your feet if you would. 
Y'all, we've been blessed with talents, wealth, knowledge, time, and ultimately we're expected to do these well, to glorify God. To much is given, much is required. Will you lift your hands open-handed towards heaven? Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25 says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be himself refreshed. God, today, we wanna be good stewards of what you've provided. We wanna be good stewards with our time, our talent, and our, and our resources. But God, the reality is stewardship begins in the heart. It begins in the heart where we align ourselves and we're faithful, God, to you who has been so faithful. God, let us recognize this weekend that stewardship is for every season. God, that you are asking us daily to be a blessing to others. And the reality is every time we bless someone else, you'll bless us back. And you'll supernaturally provide all that we need so that we can be a blessing to others. And God, we trust you and we thank you. Stewardship requires willingness. So God, we get out of the way so that the greater good of your kingdom can advance. Forgive us for ever getting in the way and making this about us. In a time that's so uncertain, the thing that is certain is your presence. So we lean on you and not our own understanding. In Jesus' name, put your hands down. Look at me real quick. I wasn't gonna tell this story, but it felt like I was supposed to. I have a friend right outside Missouri, and uh, he said God had been stirring in him to be a little bit more generous, and not only at their church, but with outreach and other things, and he had a $10 bill and some change on his nightstand, and he put it in his pocket, he was gonna buy uh, like a Subway sandwich or something. And I was like, why? Huh? So, it's fine, amen. And so, he, he, uh, he put it in his pocket, and he went to the gas station, and, and he said hi to the lady that was pumping the gas across the way, and he noticed that she pumped it really fast. He said, how much did you put in? She said, $4. $4.26. He said, oh, she said, I was gonna, get, I was gonna put 15 in, but I, I, I guess I don't have, didn't have the cash that I thought I had. And he said, well, hey, and he pulled out the money. He counted it up. Y'all, the 10 in the change added up to exactly $15. He was like, whoa, I'm not gonna eat today, but I'm gonna bless somebody. So he ran to the gas station and says, hey, at pump four, I, I, wanna, I wanna put this right here. He went out and said, can I finish it off? So he, he, he pumped $15. She was like, thank you so much. He went to work, didn't brag about it, didn't tell anybody about it. Coworker walked in and said, hey, I think I owe you lunch today. Brazilian Steakhouse. He's like, yes, you do. Amen. <laughs> Unlimited meats? For sure. So he said he went home that night and the Lord said, I want you to start giving a $10 bill away from that right pocket every day. He said, at that time, they were in a really lean season. He said, after about a week, God always put it back. He said, he moved to a $20 bill. He said, and God always put it back. He said, at the end of the month, his wife's like, how are we giving this much? He said, because God is, there's all these unexpected bonuses and blessings and we inherited some money from an uncle I didn't even know. Like there was all kinds of money that came in. And watch this, in four years, this is a true story. In four years, this is part of his testimony because he positioned himself and was a good steward with what God had entrusted him with. He said, this right pocket has given over $340,000 away to people in need. He didn't put it on YouTube. It wasn't some viral thing. He's just consistent because God will provide and every farmer gets to keep a little seed himself. He will bless you when you're willing to step out of your comfort zone and be generous and a blessing to others. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you today for your power and your spirit. God, let this fall on good ground today. I know it's a little uncomfortable talking about stewardship and it's a little uncomfortable talking about money, but God, you've entrusted us with so much. God, let us be a great example of how to be good stewards of what you've entrusted us with. With every eye closed at Cinco, at Woodlands, watching online in the room here at West Houston, if you're here today and you said, Daniel, the truth is all this is out of order in my life because I don't know Jesus. The foundation of everything we do here is Jesus. I wanna walk in this type of authority. I wanna live my life to the fullest and I wanna fulfill my call, but I don't know him. Or maybe you're the second invitation. And you said, Daniel, the truth is I don't know Jesus as my savior anymore because I've fallen away and I wanna rededicate my life this weekend. I'm gonna to count to three, and here at Hope City, we will not embarrass you. It's God's job to change you, but it is our job to walk with you so that you can be discipled. When I hit three, I want you to lift up your hand and say, today's my day. I wanna give my life to Jesus to rededicate my life. One, today's my day. Two, I'm gonna surrender everything. Three, if that's you, lift up your hand. Hands are going up all over the place here at West Houston. I know at Cinco and Woodlands as well. Come on, Hope City, let's give them a hand. If you're watching online, you can type yes to Jesus right now. 
All right, so we're gonna pray a prayer, not for symbolic or ritual reasons, but we're gonna pray a prayer out of Romans 10, verse nine and 10, it says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. Pray this with me, say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it hasn't worked. From today on, I choose to live for you. You are my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord. Thank you for forgiving me, and thank you for loving me and unlocking assignments and gifts and talents in my life. I will live for you and get my yes out of the way every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise? Let's go.